Paddock is a training and exercise space for sport, education, and performance. Each week, we look to grow ideas and innovation through conversation from beautiful Auckland, New Zealand. Welcome to this new week of On the Paddock. This week, we're speaking with Jaron Kanga, senior lecturer from the School of Sport, uh, has a master in sport and exercise science, currently working towards his PhD in the relation between growth, maturation, and youth basketball players. And he'll talk a little bit to us a little about that today. Um, also, the strength conditioning coach for the Auckland Dream, which is the female uh, basketball team for Auckland that plays in the National Basketball League um, that won the championship, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in 2019, uh, Jaron. Yep. Yep. Um, also is um, a junior performance coach for, for Basketball New Zealand and runs all their performance testing across the country, uh, which I'm also very lucky to be part of the guys that goes and helps out Jaron on this uh, huge task that because uh, we'll, we'll probably talk we're going to actually talk a, bit, a little bit about that today and um and he's also the strength and conditioning performance lead for the steve adam camps here in new zealand so um when steve adam runs the camps um in new zealand uh the person that's behind the scenes running the performance testing and, and organizing all that is um as jaron himself uh he's had uh, the fortune opportunity and also because of his of his work and his talent to work with current and former uh, tall firms. Um, he's a real knowledgeable SNC that um, understands the whole pathway and, and his background and his research also um, shows how he understands that whole development path pathway in terms of developing uh, athletes in the strength and conditioning, but also how to keep them there and how to enhance them when we're looking at that higher level when we're getting into the high performance space. Jaron, thanks a lot for spending a bit of time. Um, you have a big day, I know, coming up tomorrow. We're not going to give too much insight to that. So I know you've been a bit busy, but it's awesome that you were able to tee up a time so we can have this conversation on the paddock. Thanks, man. How, how's it going? Hey, good, Fran. Thanks for having me along. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm here for the ride. Good stuff. Good stuff. Did I get your intro right? Am I missing any any other cool? Yeah, you, you probably, stuff? Uh, probably oversold the Adams, uh, Stephen Adams thing just a little bit. Um, yeah, so, you know, I don't run all of it all the time. I've, I've been um, fortunate to be given an opportunity to, to run it um, uh, two times in the last, you know, in the, the last, uh, well, before COVID happened. Um, and that was due to, you know, just being asked to, to come and run it because the, the original strength and conditioning coach was, you know, away on other on other basketball duties. And so, you know, I had that opportunity to, to be involved in it. And um, yeah, so um, always, always keen for opportunities like that. And, um, you know, always, always ready for opportunities like that when they do arise. So um, yeah, I'm uh, blessed to be given these kind of opportunities and um, I enjoy them when they, when they come. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, Jaren. Um, you, you have a strong interest in basketball, you're at SNC. Uh, tell us a little bit of background. Uh, where does this all start? Well, uh, have you got uh, a few hours on this podcast? Or <laughs> yeah, yeah, just, no, just go, just go for it. I think, I think, I think it's really yeah. important, especially uh, for people coming into the industry, um, to understand, to, to actually see where, where the experience comes from and and the, and the the journey that. Uh, people like yourself have traveled to actually get these opportunities and how you prepare yourself to actually be able to take them just like you were saying uh, with the Steve Adam, Adam camps. So uh, yeah, no, happy, happy to listen to your whole story. Uh, well, actually um, it all just start, started with basketball. Uh, basketball is a, is a, is a passion of mine. And ever since being a, a young fella um, playing the game um, when, when I was younger, and um, yeah, I had no no idea what strength and conditioning was. Like that was that wasn't on the radar until about maybe five six years ago, um, like properly. Um, but 
uh, I'll tell you why in, in the story. So me being a young young player, um, as as all young basketball players want to do, is improve their performance. You know, they want to they want to dunk the ball. That's that's probably the main thing. And so going through my basketball career, um, yeah, going online when the internet was, you know, with a 56K dial-up modem and just going online and, you know, looking for like programs or things to do. And yeah, so started off like that, doing training, training myself, using using things that I saw from, you know, videos, books and stuff like that. And then, yeah, just trying to be a, a better athlete uh, in the sport. And um, along the way, I kind of fell into the chronic overuse injury kind of, you know, scenario where, being young, immature, not knowing what to do and trying to do everything. Um, yeah, that kind of put me um, into a position where I was getting chronic um, knee pain and, and developing um, patellar tendinopathy. And, um, and yeah, and just going through that, but I always had an interest in sport. So, you know, did PE at school, yeah. um, played all, all sorts of different sport as well. And then going into uni, that's where I started doing my, um, my degree in, in um, sport and exercise science. And then using that as like my kind of interest and education to finding out, you know, how can I improve myself from a from a physical performance point of view, and also looking at how I can prevent injuries and stuff like that from happening. And so then from there, that progressed into my masters. And so my masters, that's when I looked at using exercise therapy or exercise as a as a kind of um, uh, uh, treatment modality for jumper's knee. And so that's what I that's what I did for my master's thesis, and um, yeah, and then from from there on, I guess my basketball kind of um, slowed down. So you know, instead of playing competitively, I was playing a little bit more socially now, and um, and then going into coaching. So uh, I, I coached at school. So at high school, I coached in like sixth form and seventh form. I started coaching there as well, and then I did a little bit of coaching in between. But then I kind of picked up. Um, more coaching with like the rep teams, uh, like for counties Monaco and um, and uh, a lot of more the club and school teams um, in the in the past few years. So the past few years I've been coaching at uh, Pubsoi High School. So I was there for a few years, and then prior to that was all the all the representative stuff. But yeah, a lot of a lot of that comes just down to time. So having the time to be able to to invest into coaching and, and developing others um, alongside work and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, so it's still been in there for a while doing that. And then um, when I, oh, sorry, when I finished my studies, I was working as, as, a, as a fitness instructor and personal trainer, and but I was doing strength and conditioning things. And I didn't realize that it was actually quite separate. So, you know, I thought being a personal trainer um, but I was doing like personal training for athletes, but that, you know, that actual term, um, which um, I found out was more in relationship to strength and conditioning. So when you're training athletes or working with professional teams or sports teams and whatnot, you're, you're considered a strength and conditioning coach. Uh, when you're working with individuals that want to lose weight and get fitter, get stronger, get bigger, that kind of stuff, you're more of a personal trainer doing the one-on-one -on -one stuff. So yeah, that's the kind of differences. And then along the side, then it's when I kind of got, um, I guess, my accreditations in strength and conditioning, because it's, it's different and it's separate to being a personal trainer. So there's a lot more science involved and a lot more um, planning and like periodization and that kind of stuff um, from the SNC side of space. And because a lot of professional SNCs are more heavily invested in the teams. And also on top of that, they are responsible, you know, for those teams' physical pre preparations. And so if you, for example, hurt or injure, you know, a player, you know, from the things that you do, you know, that that can be, um, you know, uh, uh, impactful on like, your career and stuff because that you know your job is to make sure that they're injury free that they can perform to their their highest level and also you know perform on game days and stuff like that so that's where the kind of snc field sits it's in that science kind of uh background and role whereas with the um personal trainer role you're just more dealing with the um uh, individuals that want to you know improve their health and stuff like that so it's not it's not um I could you could say that they both come from a similar background but it's not to say that a personal trainer is um is different to a 
strength and conditioning coach completely. They both share the same kind of principles and learning and stuff, but I guess the responsibility is a little bit different for a personal trainer in comparison to a strength and conditioning coach of a, you know, of a professional team. So yeah, and then I guess with my passions of basketball and training, I kind of combined the two. So that's where, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate to do strength and conditioning stuff in a, uh, in a basketball space. Yeah, this actually awesome, awesome that you've if you've given us a real lengthy journey of what's happened because this is a situation many times for um for for young for young people that are interested in in sport or interested in the fitness industry, uh, or exercise that um they they start looking at different ways of doing things for themselves, which is what your journey was, and then you experienced injuries and through injuries that kind of led to your search for discovery of solutions through education and study. And that's led you through this whole journey of uh, this academic journey in terms of understanding better um, injury, but also understanding better how to train athletes so they can be injury free while they're training and so they can get to performing. So I, I want to touch upon a little bit, um, a few things for thinking of our international audience. So you mentioned Form six and seven that you've been a coach for form six and seven. That'd be juniors and seniors in high school for. That would be uh, so form six and seven. Uh, that would be like uh, year twelve and thirteen. 13. Yeah, so the twelve, year, 13, year 12 and thirteen. So these are the last two years of high school. Uh, yeah, the last year. two years. So I I got into coaching in sixth form or, or year year twelve, and then um and then yeah I did some more coaching when I was year thirteen. Uh, when me and uh, one of my best mates at school we we coached the um the girls team there oh, cool. the, the girl the girls basketball team, and then that kind of spurred my interest in coaching as well. And then that's where I kind of saw some of the relationships between you know coaching and education and training, and you know they all they all kind of fit together in, in, in some formal way. Um, but yeah, so that was my first, um, I guess, taste of coaching. And then I didn't coach for a few years after that, but then I got back into it and did a bit more um, recently in the last, you know, probably in the last 10 years, I probably did a, a lot of, a lot more coaching since then. It, it is, it is really cool. I, I'm, one of the things that I, I love about hearing your story is that it's driven by passion. And for so many of us that are involved in sport, that's what actually gets us involved in sport and keeps us in it is that passion that we have and you have it for basketball. And, um, and just for, for the people that are listening to, uh, we, we share a few things here. Like, well, uh, we share a common interest or strong interest in basketball. Um, I have beaten uh, Jaron, one on one, I must say that. Um, though the you tell your of, story, friend. You tell your story. So <laughs> if I, I have beaten. It was a hard fought game, but I have beaten uh, Jaron one on one. Um, but we also share that we both teach on the on the coaching paper, and um, and, and and that passion uh, around how we relate to students with regards to. Um, them connecting with their athletes and, and coaching is something that we share in many of our discussions on on the weekly. So um, in, th in that case, uh, in, th in that situation is where we actually share a lot. And um, and I have to say that you still love training. You are a training freak. Um, and you and you put those to, to our team, you put those really heavy trainings on us uh, to take on, which I kind of skip but uh, but 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 you're still this is this is just to highlight the passion that you carry that you you live by it that you actually put uh, passionate trainings together that you back yourself into as as well and this is really important because at the end of the day in your relationship with athletes they need to see that to actually connect with what you're trying to do with them don't you think Definitely, definitely agree. I mean, you know, some it's like the saying, you know, you walk the walk and or you you walk the talk. So you know, you know, being able to to demonstrate, um, you know, exercises and and things like that, you know, on the court or in the gym. Um, yeah. So being able to do both, uh, I guess, until I can no longer do both, um, then yeah, I'll, I'll keep doing it. Um, I want to I want to go back a little bit to where you were talking about, um. The difference between personal training and SNC, a strength conditioning coach. And one of the main differences is about working with that periodization that you're talking about. Um, for, for those that are listening that are, are just getting into this world, can you, can you explain to us a little bit what is periodization? Um, what does it consist on? What is the point of it? 
uh, what does it benefit? If you could just go a little bit into to, to, to the importance of that in, in the different scenarios. Yeah, sure, friend. Um, so what periodization is, is, is a planned training program. I mean, even in, in the, um, in a personal trainer space, I mean, you still do that as well. Uh, but for strength and conditioning coaches, they like to use variations of periodized plans. So then, you know, during this part of the phase of their season or competition, they know what to train for. And, um, and then there's different layers to that. So let's say, for example, you start at, you, 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 it's like planning out a whole year. So we're gonna plan out a whole year uh, we, we know when the competition is, we know when the preseason is, we know when the off-season is. And then during those phases of competition, we then implement certain training strategies in, you know, in certain blocks for the year. So, for example, in off-season, that's where we, you know, for like a rugby team or, or any kind of team that, that involves physicality or contact, that's where they might be doing some hypertrophy training, for example, where they put on that muscle mass, put on some size, get a little bit bigger. And then as we progress into preseason, well, we start to build fitness and then we get stronger as well. And then once we get into that competition phase, we then implement some power training. So therefore they'll be, you know, primed and powerful and fit as the season is about to start. And then during the season, we might look to maintain what we have. So there are a lot of different variables, um, but just to be brief, that's that's a kind of a, in a nutshell of what periodization is. And then in terms of the blocks, uh, strength coaches have different blocks that they might have. So 12 week hypertrophy block, 12 week strength block, 12 week power block. And then within those blocks, they have like, you know, more smaller cycles. So like you got your um, meso cycles and micro cycles of those sessions. So, you know, today's day one of a, power lifting phase where you might introduce some exercises and conditioning drills and stuff like that so yeah so that's that's the kind of overview of what periodization is and how it's implemented into a into the course of a season for a particular sport now you've been on both sides on the s and c side of a team like for example at the moment with the Alkin dream but you've also been on the coaching side of a team how important is that planning uh, to get it right between both sides so you can eventually obviously get that periodization right yeah no it's um it's, it's very important um i guess it depends on the relationship you have with your coaches uh you know i, I that is a um i guess it's a 50 50 kind of thing like um some coaches are pro strength and conditioning some coaches aren't um and depends on you know what what the, the coaches um, feel like they want into their program. So again, it comes back down to the type of program it is, the type of budget that's in the program. Um, some programs that don't have a budget for, for a strength and conditioning coach may not have strength and conditioning. So they just go and you know come out and train and play and, and expect players to go do their own thing. Uh, when you're fortunate to be in a team that has you know the availability to put in or include a strength and conditioning coach or a physiotherapist, you know having having um, having like a performance team is, is quite crucial. And then having the coach buy into, you know, the things that you do is going to be, of course, an, an important fact as well. So, you know, you, you're you meeting with the physio, you're talking about players and where they're at in terms of their injury, when they come back to play, once they come back and they're able to run and, and do all those kind of things, or they're, they're cleared for training, then, you know, you as the as the SNC have to work on with the, the physio to help build them, make sure that they're strong enough and handle certain scenarios. And then, you know, from there, from there, then the coach might say, okay, now you're, you're able to play and, and, and doing that. So having um, a coach who is on board with, you know, with a health team um, is, is, is crucial for the success of that to happen. Uh, without, without that buy-in, I guess, um, yeah, it could be all over the place. So, but once you have that buy-in from the coach, then obviously the coach will then, work with you okay cool so this is when the season is this is when competition is what do we do so you know then obviously then the coach can give that role to the to the physical performance coach and say okay cool well these guys need to be fit for blah 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 here's your window you got to do what you got to do so then yeah that could be the scenario that it could be now, I, I, I know through the, your research work you you have looked at LTDA long-term athlete development um well and, and, and really in depth um, and we have all sorts of programs um, in regards to youth sports for example let's think in that at that high school level and then into that pre-adult level once they leave school um, 
what's your intake? What's from, from your professional and academic um, viewpoint? What do you think is ideal? Do you think um, teams should be including a strength and conditioning program? Like you said, um, some coaches are in favor of strength conditioning. Others are not so in favor of strength and conditioning. Um, I know your chosen sport is, is basketball, but from your viewpoint, just strictly from your viewpoint, from your background and your knowledge, uh, what do you think is the ideal scenario? Understanding that does, it does, it does mean that it's resources are, will be needed for, uh, for the different situations. Yeah. Uh, obviously in a, in a, um, scenario where money isn't a problem and resourcing isn't a problem yeah i definitely have you know a strength and conditioning coach from day one um and reason being for that is when when you're dealing with you know uh individual who's new to sport new to training they need to learn it's just like when you go to school right so you go to school and you learn math well you're not going to start doing algebra and math you're going to start by learning one plus one then you know and then going into multiplication then division then algebra and then all that kind of stuff well it's like physical movement kids at at this day and age are probably a little bit more um, inclined to inactivity you know we're, we're sitting in front of uh, screens a little bit more handheld devices a lot more and so a lot of these kids are needing to learn how to run how to jump how to walk uh, and these are all kind of motor skills that are that are beneficial from a performance perspective um, you might see a kid who knows how to run but they don't know how to skip so that is another performing factor where I think, you know, that is quite important. So when they can get into a S&C program at a younger age, their ability to improve their movement competency and their skills to do certain movements, uh, they will improve probably a bit more significantly in comparison to someone who's just joined a sporting team when they're 14 years old, you know, and they're, and they're learning how to play. So, yeah, think of it as a, like, for example, we've got literacy and numeracy for um, reading and writing and doing um, uh, uh, mathematics. Well, let's think of it as physical literacy. So learning how to walk before you run, learning how to run properly before you sprint, learning how to land before you jump, um, climb yeah and then building those things from a from a physical standpoint so like you know if, if it was up to me I would say like you know for schools to start including that in PE you know like like having physical education teachers actually teach people how to do physical education um, and proper physical education as in you know movement wise you know learning how to lift things um, because you know that that becomes a, a priority uh, well that sorry that's not a priority at the moment in a lot of different schools you know we're learning about coaching we're learning about sport and stuff but there's actually I don't I mean this is me because I'm not in the school-based program so I'm not too sure um, but you know I, I don't think there are school programs that are in there when you're like year nine or um, at even uh, year seven and eight at intermediate or whatever you know they're learning how to do these skills um, which we would call play. You know, kids would go out and play, climb trees, ride bikes. You know, they're learning those different movements and skills and playing a lot of different sports. Uh, once we get to high school, a lot of the a lot of those things become more um, specialized. Okay, you, your third form. Okay, I'm playing this particular sport, so I'm doing more specific um, sporting drills related to that sport. So you know, you, for example, if you play cricket or if you play uh, hockey, you know, you're you're doing hockey specific skills or cricket specific skills whereas when they're still at that young age they should be learning multiple skills moving in multiple planes and uh, developing all those other movement competencies across the board yeah i mean this resonates really strongly with me and we're going to be talking about performance testing uh, that, that you, you that you lead and i have a chance to, to do with you and um, well, it's been a couple of years now due to COVID that uh, I haven't been able to take students myself overseas uh, to do internships. Uh, but two, two, three years ago when we were overseas and we were doing uh, performance testing with our, with our students overseas, one of the things, and, and those students had also been your students, uh, one of the things that we picked up in the debriefs that we would have in the evenings after we would go out and do these, um, these testing sessions or these coaching sessions was around the movement competency how we were doing broad jumps as a performance test and we were seeing that kids didn't know how to jump on two feet 
Um, and and it's because we've lost that sense of play over over the years uh, due to the way that we live life nowadays. Um, when we were kids, we would play hopscotch, so we would be jumping on one foot, two feet all the time, and we that was kind of the things that we did for play. But kids nowadays didn't, and um, and you're absolutely right that movement competency that. For example, when you're teaching a sport, what we were doing overseas a couple of years ago is we were going to schools and, and teaching rugby, right, uh, with our students. Um, and we would have, for example, a group of, of, of girls, 17, 16, 17 year old girls that didn't know how to pick up a ball, the lift movement. Uh, it was an awkward lift movement, you know, uh, and it's that movement competency that's not there. But in our New Zealand context, Darren, um, our kids in general, are pretty sporty in New Zealand because we still have an outdoors type of a uh, of bringing up of, of our kids. Um, if we bring in more of these motor skills, more movement competency, more physical literacy, like you mentioned it, for coaches now thinking in that coaches uh, the coaches with their coaches hat on, what's the benefit of that for them that those kids have better uh, motor skills? Comp, uh, movement competency or physical literacy what's the benefit for the coach that actually wants their back line to run well what's the benefit for the coach that wants their shooting guards to actually just make the shots exactly that if they if if they can move well they can perform well like you know and and on top of that they will be more likely to be injury free you know so because you can move well you can land well when you come across that moment in a game where you you know you're trying to tip the ball and you know when you're having a uh when you're in competition and when the stakes on the line and you you make those rash decisions where you try to steal the ball or intercept or or tackle someone or step someone or whatever you're ready for it you know that that is that preparation that you would have to to move um and so therefore you know as a coach who would love someone who can move athletically really really well like a lebron james who can you know do everything compared to someone who can't move like that you know who would you want and so therefore if they have that freak of nature can move really well i mean there's only a few gifted people who you know who, who can who can do that and have that ability um but like like a lot of times we can teach kids the basics of these yeah. of these skills and then that in turn can lead to better performance um all over you know, whatever sport that they play. So if they can move well, if they can perform well, that can then be transferred to whatever sport that they play. And when you're talking about that, you did mention earlier around the, the, the issue around early specialization, um, that early specialization takes away uh, a little bit from athletes being able to learn more movements to keep them at a higher level of performance. So from a strength conditioning, from that health coach, let's call it, um, uh, or, or trainer uh, developing this physical literacy, uh, thinking that we could actually be more impactful at an early age, uh, Jaren, um, what are the benefits for that under 15s rugby coach for their, for their players to be doing multiple sports? Uh, what's the benefit for that, for, uh, that prem basketball coach at a school for their players to be playing other sports as well. What's the benefit? That's the benefit. It's them being having a more high, highly skilled athlete who can have better spatial awareness in, in different sporting codes. You know, like some, some for example, you know, for basketball, you have, you know, being aware of space, passing, moving, cutting, seeing players, and you can apply those same certain skills in touch rugby, rugby league um for example if you're looking at um a rugby player you know they they learn catching and passing which you know you could use different passing um skills to do the same job like you you look at um uh, sonny bill williams you know who who's who's an athlete that has has uh, transcended across different sporting codes rugby league um uh, uh boxing right so and and um, a lot of research shows that those play, those people who perform very very um, well and do well at a professional level in a certain sport, they have the ability to play across codes. You know, they they're the ones that have the skill set to be able to go and play 
you know, baseball and then go and play basketball or go and do golf or go, you know, they have that ability to transfer those skills across. Um, and again, having that ability to um, have multiple skills in their back pocket, they can, you know, pull those out when they need to in a, in a certain situation. So um, footwork, for example, uh, a, a good example in relation to basketball is Steve Nash. Steve Nash is, you know, MVP basketball player in the NBA, but he played soccer when he was younger. So, you know, playing soccer helped him with his footwork and with his footwork, you know, that made him a bit and obviously playing um, soccer, you've got that spatial awareness as well, you know, passing, cutting, seeing the, seeing, you know, the whole field, seeing the floor. And that's probably what made him a, a good uh, point guard um, in his, in his position in, in, in that sport. So, yeah, so all these players and athletes that are very good at one particular sport and they do w really well at the elite level, they're, mo they're most likely to do really well in another sporting code as well. Now, with regards to that, when, I mean, it's a, we know the benefit of actually being able to do multiple sports and uh, that you've just explained. Would it be recommended for them to be doing it simultaneously? For example, the example of Steve Nash to be playing football on the weekend and playing basketball on the Wednesday nights, would you be recommending that? Uh, uh, thinking of our New Zealand uh, teenage athletes in that years 12 and 13, would you be recommending that or, or what are the, what are the pitfalls or what are the precautions yep. that should be taken? Yeah. So that's a good question as well. That's come up through, you know, like what the, what the um, government has put through at the moment, uh, the sports. Um, balance is better. Uh, balance is better. Correct. Yeah. So that's the one. So with the balance is better initiative, what they recommend is that yes, kids should be playing a whole lot of different sports, um, ideally, but not all at the same time. So, because um, what happens is when you're playing sport at the same time is that, well, you may have soccer practice and then you've got a soccer game and you've got like, you know, three or four other trainings that you're mixing together as well. So it's good that you're getting the, the mix of the different sports. However, it's not very good because you're not focusing fully on that one particular sport and you're more likely to um, induce some overuse injuries because of your overtraining, you're over committing to five or six different sports. And, and that's, that's, that's um, what's coming out at the moment in terms of New Zealanders, you know, we've got um, this balance is better program, but you know, like, for example, this, this um, season, you might want to do football, then the next season, you might want to do another sport. And then, you know, so that way you, you get a good range of sports, but you're not overloading yourself from a um, from an injury or repeti re repetitive strain point of view. So, you know, you got players who may play sports that do a lot of jumping. So, you know, if you're playing basketball and you're playing volleyball, right, you're doing, you're doing movements that are replicated in both sports and that can cause, a, you know, a lot of strain um, to the joints. And that's where, you know, jumper's knee can occur in that particular instance, if you're, you know, have you playing two codes that are the same. Ideally, you want to play two codes that are different, like a winter code and then a summer code. And that possibly uses different body parts, and, and that way it kind of balances out your your development of um, of the body as well as the other kind of mental and social aspects of the game. Yeah, and it, that's that's the that's the big challenge because usually when you're if you're participating in different codes, um, the the coaches are different, um, so and Correct. and they're not talking to each other, um, and the only binding link there is the athlete. So the athlete wants to perform in both and that's where it leads to that overuse and, and overtraining and type of injuries um, and that's where the athletes need that advocate whether it's the parent whether it's that school sports coordinator that is actually going to be um, kind of managing that development of that athlete in regards to their training load if they're doing three trainings for one code a week that might not give them space to be doing trainings on the other code or, or how do you, or, right. how, or how do you do it? So mm. um, I think, especially with our young people, that's probably um, something we need to look for that advocacy, uh, whether it's coming from the parents, whether it's kind of coming from the guardians, whether it's coming from those um, sports coordinators that have that relationship with all the other coaches that that young person's in, involved with. Uh, let me, let me take you a little bit to something that's a big passion of yours as well, but you're also very involved in and in, in doing uh, quite a lot, which is performance testing. Um, well, well, I know because well, we do this together. Um, 
the, the performance testing for New Zealand basketball that you lead. Um, I know that that's also uh, helping quite a bit towards uh, the, the research that you're focusing on at, uh, in, in, at, the, at the moment. But um, let's look, let's talk about performance testing from a practical point of view. Um, what, is, what, what is performance testing for our audience? And why do we do it? Why do we even think about it? Good question, Fran. Um, well, performance testing is just a fancy word for testing. It's basically just doing a test, right? Uh, we use the word performance is because if you're relating it to a sporting context, you know, you can kind of get that buy-in in terms of, uh, of the, the athletes that are partaking in it. And again, we want to see how they perform, right? So hence the word performance. Um, but essentially, it's just a test to identify where they are. Right. So why we do it and the benefits of doing it is one, as a as a um, as a strength and conditioning coach, I would like to know where my players are currently. Right. So if I know where they are currently and from that point, I know where they need to go from there. So if we say, for example, you do a beep test or a yo-yo test and you score 15 or something right and then I know in that instance that certain players in a certain sport need to be at a certain level well we can say okay that's where you are right now we need to put we need to do some work to get you to 18 or 19 or whatever the numbers may be so that's you know that's the first thing is to identify a starting point for an individual uh, also to identify where they currently are at as well you know you say oh yeah Fran you come in and you say to me, yeah, I've been working all summer. You know, I've been going for runs. Well, let's go and do a fitness test, see what you do. And then numbers don't lie, right? So I can tell, well, Fran, you've been, you've been telling porkies to me, all right? It's, uh, you, you, you've been having too much pork buns instead of doing what you're supposed to be doing. And that's how I know. So that's, that's one of the reasons why, um, you know, we do that performance testing in terms of uh, the, in terms of the teams that you work with. Now, performance tests that you can do is going to be dependent on, obviously, the, the strength and conditioning coach. Some coaches have some preferred tests that they like to use. Uh, some coaches have tests that they like to use. And, and um, yeah, it comes down to personal preference, really, and, and their reasons for why they, they use those tests. Um, other reasons for using performance tests is obviously, you know, using that as a, as a motivator. If you're, you know, comparing other players or other athletes in your team, you can say, well, so-and-so is the fittest on the team. So-and-so is the unfittest on the team. So then that can give, that might give them that motivation to, to do better. Uh, other, other ways that they could be used is, um, you know, selecting players. Okay, so performance tests can be used in that in that way, shape, or form, um, but that's only from a physical standpoint. So some players might be selected because they have the IQ of you know of and the skills of the game, but they might be unfit. So then, okay, well that's a job for the SNC coach to make them fitter. Um, some players will be like really really fit and they can play at that level, but they may not have the skills. So um, I guess from a um, from a selection or talent ID standpoint, you can use, you know, those measures to do that. Um, it get, it just, I guess it just gives a quantified um, measure or validation to the coach to say that, okay, well, we've, if we've got like six players that are playing for the same spot and they're all very good, maybe doing a fitness test can then determine who I'm going to choose. Okay, well, we're, we've got five good players. They all can catch, pass, shoot whatever but out of all five only two of them are very fit if we have time to get them fitter then they might make some other decisions if we don't have time and we're going to compete in the next two or three weeks i'm going to take the two fittest guys right knowing knowing that um so yeah there there's um those reasons for doing the tests um and then another reason is from a youth standpoint if we can assess you know, youth at, at a younger age, they can see how they're performing or comparing themselves against others of the same age group and, and looking at a at, from a norms point of view. So where they sit, you know, so for a group of basketball players, do you jump high for a basketball player in that particular position? And you can also compare yourself or get that. Or if I, if I play for the tall blacks, I might be 
you know, jumping this high or running this fast or whatever. So there's, yeah, there's lots of different reasons why people do performance testing. Um, those are the different benefits and that's how it can be used to, to do that. Now, it's really important what you're mentioning is that when we're, use, when we're benchmarking as an analysis tool for the, the results that you get on, on a test, who we're benchmarking against uh, because we can't benchmark the results of a 16, 17 year old against what is happening in super rugby. Um, and many times we, that's, that's the benchmark. Oh, well, Beck's at a super rugby level. This, so that's what he should be aspiring to. But th that child or that youth is going to be aspiring to that maybe in five years time. Um, mm -hmm. And, and for that, at the end of the day, so you can do those type of analysis, you do require a lot of data. You do require to have that age group data that you were talking about. Um, and, um, and I'm going to get you to talk about a little bit what the research that you're doing um, at, the, at the moment, because I, I had the experience of working with that age group data uh, with AFL New Zealand, which was quite cool because we did have that insight to what was happening with similar age groups in Australia uh, in regards to the performance tests that uh, AFL run across all of Australia and, and, and we were running here in New Zealand. So you were able to see, look, this is what a 60 year old should be achieving on a jump if he was going to be of a potential to reach the AFL. Um, or this is how, how much he's getting on a beep test. So we had those measures. So the benchmarking could be done and eventually the talent ideas can actually go, you know what, this, this person is falling in that in the range of where we think he could develop into an AFL player. Um, but, but we were looking at age group data. We weren't looking at the next level or the or the, the 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 elite level of what they perform at. So, I'm going to tie you back into your own research at the moment. How does a coach know what to analyze against? How to pick up that data and what to compare it to? So it can so it can mean something. Because I could be I could be taking data, I could be doing performance tests, but how is it going to help me? And, and one of the examples that I saw, I remember, I think it was two, three years ago with um, the junior Pumas that when they were traveling here through um, New Zealand is that the, at the start of every training, one of the performance tests that they ran with the, the players was, were broad jumps. But that performance test was just to benchmark against their own stats of their own players. Because if they were more or less steady on their broad jumps, and I remember talk, talking to their SNC about it, it meant that that player was was healthy at his health level. But if, he, if, if something was happening with that broad jump, it was getting shorter on his landings, for example, um, it meant that the human might be carrying a strain. And maybe they needed to look at the uh, some other figures of terms of uh, reducing his load for that training, et cetera. So they did that as part of the warm up. They were taking uh, measures of their of their broad jumps as, as, a, as an indicator. But a high school coach in our in our in our highly developed uh, high school programs. What what could be the use? What what analysis could we use out of out of these uh, performance tests? Uh, well, that's that's I guess you already mentioned it um, for athlete monitoring. Okay, so doing so doing that broad jump is a form of athlete monitoring. Um, a lot of teams do like say for example vertical jumps and they do that on like a force platform and they do that daily or weekly or whatever and then if the results change yeah like you said they could be carrying a strain they could they may not be performing well because they didn't have enough sleep or, or something like that so that's that's one of the things that you can do on a regular basis for analyzing performance. Um, in a high school setting, I mean, obviously, in our high schools, we, you know, a lot of a lot of the schools don't have the resources to do those kind of things. So, um, ideally, the, I mean, for a coach to interpret that data, uh, and if they don't have the actual, if they don't have the scientific knowledge or the the background or experience, they could interpret that data incorrectly as well. So, you know, it, it, it's best to make sense of that data with a sports scientist or with a strength and conditioning coach who has that background knowledge. Um, but as, as a coach, I mean, they can only see that from, you know, uh, uh, face value. Um, to get the insight, obviously, they've got to go through a little bit more training and a little bit more understanding of, of that material. Um, and like you said, that's that's one way of using performance data, which is to, to inform athlete readiness. And then using that, we can then, 
you know deload them this week or or if they're if they're not feeling too well we can then you know modify their training and stuff like that so uh from that point of view that's what we what you do but then for a coach then they could use that performance testing like at the beginning of the season to you know select players for their team identify you know who's doing well and who isn't doing well you could have pre the the tests at the beginning and at the middle and then near the near the end of the season to see where you know see where everybody is um if they're you know if they're playing hard and training hard you should see that their that their improvements from off season to pre-season to in competition season there you know there should be a improvement but if you see players that aren't improving then they're probably not doing the work for the coach um you know during the the course of their season so those are you know those are probably the, the only main things that you'd get out of testing um whereas if you and if you test too much if you test for the sake of testing that can sometimes be you know um detrimental to the program as well so sometimes you don't want to be doing billions and billions of tests because then like all your athletes get over it so you know why are we doing it is it worthwhile it's like if you're getting if you're getting an athlete to do a yo-yo test every single week you know they'll be they wouldn't you know enjoy that um and then what are you getting out of it so having a strength and conditioning coach on board they you should know those things knowing when to do the certain tests what time of day to do the certain tests, and then help the coach understand and interpret that data so then to make it meaningful for the coach to then implement okay cool well that's what's happening from a physiological or or, or physical point of view okay then we'll 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 do something else instead you know with the coach and and the coach may change up the training session to make it a bit more fun or you know go over technique make you know work on the more tactical kind of things rather than making them run up and down and stuff like that so yeah that's that's kind of like what you can do with it cool 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 talk to me a little bit what you're doing in terms of research because uh, your research is based around performance testing and um, especially with the with youth athletes um, it, it really varies what that data is going to be telling you about the, the youth athlete and, um, and, those, and those training blocks that uh, the SSC might have um, might not be appropriate for athlete A, but very appropriate for athlete B. And, and there's different reasons why that happens. Yeah. So, um, so to answer the, the first question, so what, what I'm doing my research on is that um, I'm doing a, my PhD and um, I'm looking at the relationship between maturation and physical performance in New Zealand youth basketballers. And so what I want to try and find out is how does maturation affect performance um, and using the basketballers as my, my population group. Let me slow um, you down. Let me slow you down, Darren. For, for us lay people in, in the world, what, what are you referring to maturation? So maturation is a timing and um, duration of a individual's life where they progress to being mature so for example um, a young man or young boy who goes who grows older and as they grow older they start to mature and when they start to mature they go through a phase called puberty and once they've gone through puberty they become a man Right, so that's that's kind of process of maturation. How maturation is varied across the board. So meaning from someone who's uh, at birth to the you know to 20 years of age. So during the first 20 years of your life, you are maturing. You're going through you know different um, stages of growth and development. And so with that maturation, uh, there are different time zones for each individual. So for example, we got athlete A and athlete B, but um, and they're both 13 years of age, but athlete B could be bigger, could be taller, could be stronger than athlete A, right? So you've got these two different athletes. They're, they're both 13 years of age, but one matured earlier than the other, than the other. And that can have an impact on performance, that can have an impact on their development, and that can have an impact on their growth. Uh, and so I'm interested in, in looking at that because I've been working with youth as well and, you know, finding out that, hey, that there, there's something that, um, that, is, that is of interest because in terms of basketball, from recent research and, and obviously through what the NBA uh, data is telling us and professional level data is that teams are getting bigger 
right? So if you're looking at the size of certain teams, the height, you know, the average height of teams a few years ago was like um, on average, you know, like uh, six, three, six, four. But now we're looking at teams that are on average six, eight, six, nine. That's the average height. So from a professional standpoint and at, at the elite level, height is a, is, has been shown to be a significant in, indicator of performance um, and also selection into, into basketball teams. Um, and so, yeah, so that's you know, one factor of it, but also looking at in terms of maturation and how does maturation affect physical performance? Because you know, for someone who matures earlier, they're the ones getting that early growth spurt. So I'm playing, so if me and you, Fran, were the same age, but you mature earlier than I do, well, you're getting these advantages because of your maturation um, and because you, you know, you're biologically advanced in, in, in comparison to myself. You know? So you know, you're 13 and you already have a, a full, um, full beard and, and, um, and mustache, whereas I'm 13 and I'm still growing my little mo here. All right? So yeah, so in, in terms of that, that can have an, a direct effect on physical performance um, at that time. But, 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 but both kids would continue to grow. Correct. Or not, kids, or, would, but, but, but not necessarily. No, that's right. So, um, and that's where that, that is quite interesting to see where, okay, maybe that early mature is growing earlier and they may have a, a sustained output of growth or they might just mature early and then they finish there um, a lot of the research has shown that you early matures that once they've gone through their growth spurt that's pretty much it and then they've stopped there whereas late matures who haven't developed yet and then years later they start to develop and grow they usually grow for longer and they grow bigger and taller as well so um, yeah that's interesting to see and and you know, is it the maturation? Is it the timing of that maturation that can cause um, the the performance levels to to differ? And and that's what I want, want to have a look at and see how the relationship you, you, between you, that. You you've spoken about that uh, peak um, height velocity, um, and um, and it has to do with actually identifying when you can actually get the most performance in that in that maturation process. Um, I, I'm a coach, I'm a coach and I'm working with these 17, 18 year olds or I'm working with like those school leavers that are now in their, those academy programs transitioning to what, what could potentially be a professional career or what in the States they call the collegiate athlete. And those athletes are still maturing and they're still growing and their performance uh, can be impacted by that maturation process and by that um, and, and by their growth. So how do we know as a coach, uh, that if that athlete has more to give us, uh, do we have to wait for them or, or can we get the, the most out of them at that moment? So that's a good question, Fran. That's, that's one of the, the um, questions that I'm looking at answering as well. So what we, when we're looking at the growth of an individual, it's called peak height velocity. So peak height velocity is the time of the growth phase in the individual where the growth spurt is the highest. And um, that peak height velocity can occur in, um, in males and females, but at different times. So on average, females, they reach um, peak height velocity at around the age of 11, whereas boys, they reach or they start their peak height velocity or they're, they're in that peak height velocity from the age of 13, 13, nearly 14. And so um, obviously you can't just go, hey, kid, are you going through peak height velocity? Yeah. Right. No. So, you know, that, that's something where um, research has now gone into. So we, so there are methods to assessing maturation. Um, so the, the key methods that are used to assessing maturation is x-ray. So using it by skeletal age. And we assess skeletal age by using an x-ray and we look at bones of the wrist and we can determine, you know, depending on the shape and size of the wrist, that is their maturational state. Uh, and that is the, the kind of 
gold standard of assessing maturity. Other ways of assessing, of, of assessing maturity is using skeletal age, uh, sorry, sexual age. And that is like looking at the growth of their, of their um, genitalia and things like um, breasts and pubic hair development, and then assessing that against reference points as well. But, you know, there's invasive um, issues and concerns when doing that particular particular technique. So what um, a lot of other research have, researchers have come across is using somatic uh, assessments. And so somatic assessments is looking at how the body grows. And um, there are estimations or using uh, formulas or calculations to assess that. And that's how they came about. So uh, these formulas and um, equations were based on a group of uh, a large study of children and then they created this formula and then they they plotted these graphs of peak height velocity and then they used a calculation to estimate where they were and um, and they found that they sat in the growth curves uh, quite nicely with a with a um, with a, a low score error of maybe like three to four years so they were like three to four years off on either side. Um, and, you know, they, they kind of figured that that, that, was, that was ideal for what they had. Um, and so the method for estimation was called the maturity offset method. And this is um, uh, created by um, a researcher named um, Murwald and it's called the Murwald method. And so what they did was they, you know, they measured their heights, they measured their weights and their seated height and other variables. And they put it into this equation and based on the equation, it spat out a number. And this number told you whether they were two years away from reaching their peak height velocity or they were having, they were at peak height velocity or they were post peak height velocity. Uh, so that's the Murwald method. There was another method um, by another researcher called um, Camus and Roche. And these guys used a similar kind of method to assess um, um, peak height velocity using a percentage of predicted adult height. And so with the predicted adult height, they used their parents' heights and kind of got the mid parental height to find out, okay, so Fran, if you were 160 centimeters right now, in the next few years, where, where does that sit in comparison to the average of your parents? So, and and um, if the average of your parents was 180, well then you're likely to reach your parents' heights at full maturity, uh, the average of your parents' height at full maturity. And that, that's what they use. So that's the, the Camus Roach method. And then you've got the Merwold, which kind of gives you a time or years to um, peak height velocity. and um, and that's where the kind of sports scientist or strength and conditioning coach needs to come in to be able to explain that kind of information to a coach. And so what you're saying is, okay, cool. So now you got your players that have um, uh, been selected or whatever. Okay, then we can assess based on this somatic estimation where they are in terms of their maturation. So if we've got this player who is now sitting in pre-peak height velocity, it means that they've got a few more years before they're actually reaching their growth spurt and they can still grow taller and, and develop. Uh, whereas if you've got a player who's already matured and they're like post peak height velocity, well, that's basically the player that has already gone through their, go their growth spurt and they aren't going to be any taller or gain any size. So that, that's from a kind of IDing point of view from a performance enhancement point of view, using that from a strength and conditioning coach point of view, we can identify certain stages. So knowing where the athlete is in terms of pre, mid or post peak height velocity, we can then tailor programs to suit that individual. So a lot of the times where athletes are going through their growth spurt, that's where they start to get taller, leaner, longer. They go a little bit more uncoordinated and they're, they're at risk. Okay, that, that during that time frame, they're probably at risk to injuring themselves because they might be training a lot, but they're trying to train through their growth spurt. And um, and I guess that's where um, you know practitioners need to understand that okay, well this kid is going going through a growth spurt. We need to back off their training, or they need, or the coaches need to know that you know we can't push little Jimmy any harder because he's not he's going to be injured if we keep forcing him through that. So if we know that okay, cool, he's pre peak height velocity or post peak height velocity we can you know we can push them a bit more on those certain areas but if they're they're going through their growth spurt then we can we you know we, we back off and that that you know that's really important for you know the the strength and conditioning coach or the sports scientist to tell the coach that or 
or, or the coach to understand that. But, but, but in a team, I, I'm thinking, for example, a first 15 team, you know, or a prem netball team or a prem basketball team at a high school level, you know, you have kids between the age of 15 to 18 there. Um, how do I put together a program? Because the, the different kids will be at a different peak height velocity, wouldn't they? Yeah, that's correct. So using using these methods to, you know, obviously pick one of these methods and then implement it into your, your program. Once you've identified all these kids that are going through these certain spirits, we can group them. And this method is called biobanding. So biologically banding them into their biological maturation. So if we have a whole bunch of kids that are all going through um, uh, their peak height velocity, we can group these kids together. They can train together because they are at that maturation level where they're all growing. Or we can group them all into the pre-peak height velocity group because they haven't gone through puberty yet or they, they, they haven't gone through their growth spurt. So we can we can group those guys together and they can train together. Or we can do um, some sort of individualized training programs with that group and same for the post-peak high velocity. And so the, a, a lot of research has come out from, um, from Europe and a lot of the soccer academies. And that's what a lot of the soccer programs are doing at the moment. So especially um, in like Arsenal and, and all those top um, UEFA competitions and all those youth academies programs that's what they're doing they're bio banding a lot of their kids so then they can you know okay. talent id them and develop them so that we can find that late developer or that late mature and that late mature is is most likely going to do really well in, in you know in the sporting context probably from a, uh, a physical performance point of view but we also got to take into consideration performance isn't the key to success that's only part of the key to success in all sports. Like, you know, they've also got to have the um, mental resilience. You know, they've got to have the game IQ as well. They've got to have the skills. So performance is only one variable that, you know, that we, that we can utilize to help um, enhance that performance. That, that, no, definitely. definitely. Now, when you talk about biobanding, I, I know these um, football academies in Europe, they do start with, um, with the footballers at a young age. They take them on around 12, 13 years old. They, they start, and we, we also have the chance to see them overseas, and it, it's, it's impressive. It's impressive how these football um, clubs run these academies. Um, but thinking in our, in our, for example, our academy systems for rugby here in New Zealand, uh, or collegiate sport in the in, in America, which is that the, the the college programs, that you're getting athletes between the age of 17 to 21, 22 years old, um, would be would assessing their peak height velocity velocity be uh, called for at in, in that at that age group, or is it or is it just too late by then? Um, I mean. When you think about it, it's like, you know, what's the point? But you may be catching some of those kids at the end okay. of their of their their development. Sorry, at the beginning of their development. Because some kids don't actually mature until they reach 16 or 17. You know, you got some kids that are still growing. Uh, some some NBA examples are like Dennis Rodman and um and oh, uh, Scotty 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 Pippen. You know, they grew more in college. Uh, Michael Jordan grew in high school. So, yep. you know, in high school, we, when he got cut from his team yep. and then after the season after, he grew another like uh, six inches or something like that. I can't remember exactly. And he, and he, head, and he grew, I think from his freshman to his sophomore year in North Carolina, I think he grew another two inches as well. I yeah. think so. so yeah. Something like that. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. I mean, in the, in, there, there is, you know, there is a um, potential to, you know, use that information and to, to kind of, um, see if those players are still growing because you know then that would be useful I mean just for for monitoring um, uh, their, their growth and their and their maturation so there is there is a potential to still do that even though some of those kids may be outside of their maturation stage but then we can you know you can use easily use it to, to confirm okay yes so so and so has finished their growth spurt or so and so is still having their growth spurt so yeah we can monitor that so and, so if, if if an 18 19 year old has reached their maturation stage for example um and we can assess that and we can go yep he's reached it um could that also tell me as a trainer and a coach okay now i can start 
training him and demanding and challenging him as I do an adult athlete? Or would you not recommend that because they're still young in terms of their development in that SSC space? Um, both good questions. You, I mean, once you know that they've gone through, and again, these these equations, you know, they still have their limitations as well. So, you know, you could be off by a year or two or, or, or something like that, depending which method you use. But yeah, once we've identified that, yep, this person has, has most likely gone beyond their um, peak height velocity and they have, you know, they've gone through puberty already. Yeah, you, you, you have that ability to push them more. Um, they should be able to, with um, withstand some of the, the the harder training sessions. You know they have the they, they they've gone through puberty. They've gone through their their growth spurt. They've stopped. Now we can build muscle. We can build strength. We can build all those things that you know that potentially if we did earlier that could be at risk of you know putting them into a a chronic overuse kind of situation. So um, yeah, that that's from a physical standpoint, you could start doing that to them. Um, mentally is obviously another another facet. Of, um, of that development. So, you know, you pushing them from a mental capacity, they may not be able to handle that because, yep. you know, they haven't been mentally challenged. So from a physical standpoint, probably yes. Knowing, you know, knowing what right. you know, and you can, you can start, you know, get into the gym and start lifting heavier weights and stuff like that. So, yeah. Oh, but the, all this information is also important for the athlete to know so they can prepare themselves for the different uh, task at hand, right? whether it's exactly. physical, physical, uh, maturity, whether it's the mental maturity for the for the challenges that they need to embrace if they want to pursue that higher level uh, uh, of sport. Um, no, this is this is this is really interesting. I'm I'm really looking forward. I'm really really looking forward to your um to your um to your to the outcomes of your of your of your research. But uh, because I can see the practicality of it, and I, I can see the value of um of actually getting more of that sports science, more of that. Uh, analysis into our coaching realm. I think the more informed our coaches are in regards to the the data that comes out of our athletes. First, we can get better performing athletes. Second, get better performing teams. But thirdly, I think we can be fair in regards to the judgments that we make of athletes. And um, and I, I think in regards to that that relationship and that caring relationship that uh, coaches and trainers do have with their athletes, that's really beneficial that we can be fairer because we have better data to manage uh, and to share with our athletes and, and our relationships. So no, that's fantastic. Um, Jaren, man, this has been a great conversation. I, I had a couple of other topics, but I think we're going to do a part two uh, once you get over a little bit of, of your work, which is one of the things I really admire from you. And this is probably going to be our part two is not only the 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 knowledge work that you that you do and the research that you do, but also that relationship work that you do in regards to mentoring future uh, personal trainers and SNCs through um, internship programs that you put together for for students, so they can learn in a contextualized space with real athletes. Um, and learn the relationship base of how to put programs together. Uh, but uh, how can you can train and and work with future SNCs. Uh, I, I really admire the work that you do, how you put that together. And I think that's going to be a topic for, for another conversation. But um, I've really, really enjoyed it. I think I've learned, once again, I've learned heaps from you um, through this conversation. Um, I really look forward to the rest of your work um, and hope to have another conversation on the paddock with you in the, in the, in the future. Sounds good, Fran. Enjoyed it as well. Appreciate being on here. No worries. Well, till next week, team. Um, hopefully, you've enjoyed this conversation uh, with Jaron Kung. Uh, if you want to find out a little bit more about peak high velocity, the maturation, growth of athletes, um, SNC in general, um, the work that he does and or and how he we works with students, what he teaches, uh, feel free to contact him. His uh, email is right down uh, below. Um, like like all the rest of the team at the school of sport, they're really open to 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 meet up, to catch up with you, and and share the knowledge and and the work that they're being that they're doing. So, um, Jaron, thanks a lot for for being on the show. Um, look forward to the conversations next week with our with our next guest. Um, feel free to share this conversation, like, subscribe, all that fun stuff that you you do on social media and on web pages. And we'll see you next week on the paddock. Take care, guys.